<laughs> Job done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Imre and others. And uh, it's, it's great to be in the Grand Canaria Islands, if I get it right. As uh, Imre mentioned, ours is one of the, the newest centers. And it's a culmination of about five years of planning. Uh, I was in the engineering departments and the National Science Foundation, which is uh, probably the preeminent funding agency in the US. They had given me subtle hints to leave engineering and go towards computer science, because they felt uh, there was a need for a, an interdisciplinary perspective on uh, the design of what we call as not academic IoT-based systems, but uh, practical systems that can actually function and go beyond just uh, theorizing about new ideas, but actually working with industry in building very robust systems that would not just look at a basic technology, but would uh, push the, the technology boundaries uh, in a very ambitious manner. So our center is very unique. It's probably one of the few centers in the, in the US which, uh, with a direct mandate on cyber physical systems. So where is Oklahoma? You know, <laughs> I used to live, uh, my, my home state is, is Texas, you know, but I used to live in New Mexico, which is adjacent to Texas. So when we moved to Oklahoma, it was mainly because you know it was a slightly bigger university, but uh, we did not do a very good research on the weather and the climate. You know, so as we were packing up to leave, my son comes up to me. He was in the fifth grade. He said, "You know, Dad, that's in the tornado corridor. Did you know that? It's pretty interesting." <laughs> and since I've been there, you know, we've had a close calls, five tornadoes that just went past our house. An underground shelter is required in most places. You know, and we've had, I think, overall about 32 tornadoes. And now, uh, with our very oil-friendly government, who are doing what I call, you know, digging up the oil, I guess there's a, there's a word for it. I think it's called fracting. That's mm -hmm. the word they use. So we get volcanoes every, uh, not volcanoes, sorry, earthquakes every two days. So it goes right through my, you know, my, my living room. It's a little bit scary. There's many lawsuits, you know, against the oil companies. But like I said, the, you'll see me talk about the ethics of engineering down the road, right? Uh, the, the days have gone where we look at, at ethics as a part of our daily lives. Most engineering programs don't talk about ethics. You know, that's your problem. We'll teach the engineering. But I think that needs to be front and center if we are going to be you know, are living in what I call a civilized society. So, my talk is about this revolution that has already occurred, right? And just like in the 80s, there were Java evangelists. So we have these cyber technology evangelists. So we are self-proclaimed evangelists, not just touting about these technologies and the benefits, but cautioning people that there are major pitfalls, right? A colleague from England first said, you know, I think it was two years ago, the war with privacy is lost forever. It's gone. But she said, we can still win our battles. And that's the best we can hope for. So my talk is going to be not very academic. You know, it's going to be a little bit industry-centered, because our center, even before we were created, focused on industry. We focus on the industrial reality of these explosions. And where do engineers fit in? And there is the propensity or the potential for these to serve as catalysts, not just for capitalist markets, but also for social entrepreneurship. And some of these ideas were you know, proposed by my legendary advisor from Texas A&M. He left academia. He came from industry. He did his PhD very late in life. Then he went back to industry. He runs a very successful business enterprise. So the models that I talk about are not academic models. They are robust models that have been validated through actual industrial products and manufacturing. 
So we'll talk about this triumvirate, you know, what I call as this play on words, modeling of information, simulation of information, and exchange of information, which continues to dominate this industry. And on the evangelist side, you know, you should be aware, whichever country you belong to, you know, ask your government agencies, are we part of this new internet that is already being rolled out? There is not major fanfare where we come and say, well, this is an internet 4.0. We are rolling it out gradually with industrial projects, making actual parts. It's big in Europe, it's called the FIO Initiative. In the US we call it Genie. And I'll give you more information on how to get involved. The main reason is engineers need to be having a very dominant role in how the next internet emerges, right? The first internet was an afterthought in many ways for engineering. But we need to work on how do we inculcate the engineering perspective into a robust internet that can support a variety of applications. And then we come to the ubiquitous IoT. Where does this fit in? You know, everyone talks about it, very few actually building it. So we're going to give you a more realistic perspective on what can be done. Then I go towards the more difficult part about challenges and pitfalls, right? It's very easy for us to throw stones at others, but how are we as a community? Where are we? What is the role of faculty who resist change more than industry in many ways? So we talk about the role of engineering education, the landscape that has changed, why we faculty have to embrace this change and, you know, just like how Gandhi said, we have to be the change that we want to see in the world. If that's not going to happen, you know, asking industry to change becomes just a wasted effort. So my background is slightly different from the others, right? Before I came to academia, I worked in industry. My bachelor's degree is in mechanical engineering. You know, I grew fond of, of manufacturing. I was not into heat engines and turbines, so at the master's level, I went into industrial engineering, and that gave me a broader perspective about mostly towards manufacturing systems. And during my PhD, when I came into you know, the influence of Richard Meyer, Meyer is considered you know, one of the fathers of the information-centric principles in the US. He came out of the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base most of you may not realize in the 70s there was a very famous program in the US called the ICAM project, the notion of computer aided manufacturing. And the idea was they used this pipeline called the Blackbird. I don't know how many of you know what the Blackbird is. Anyone? This is a very famous plane, right? So when they tried to mothball it or they wanted to, they said if at some point in time we had to bring this design into manufacturing, do we have the Vavidol? to actually produce this plane. Which means the notion of capturing functional expertise into information models became very apparent. But at that, at that time, you know, trying to get engineers and computer scientists to think along the common page did not exist. But the ICAM program set the ball rolling and it said, you know, before you get into your mathematical derivations or your models, you have to have a functional basis. There was a difference between what is a functional model and a process model. And most engineers don't really know the difference. And having these two shared perspectives would mean 200 years from now, if I want to manufacture the Blackbird, I can actually do it, right? So the notion of modeling the information complexities, yes, did originate from at least one of the origins, from an Air Force base, you know, from a little known group at that time who all went into industry and some into academia. So when I left industry, my dominant or uh, my predominant drivers were, you know, this was in the 90s, right? Back in the US, if anyone knew how to do Java programming, even without a degree, they got $100,000 a year salary. We had third year students quitting school. This was in the mid 90s. But my advisor was sharp enough to predict that most of these enterprises would fail. And the predominant reason was most of these internet 
you know, explosive growth enterprises had no idea about the notion of a process and that you need to have a product looking at the various challenges. So most of them went bankrupt after three years. They made several million dollars, right, the process. But then I then realized when I started working in the industry that most computer scientists knew how to code. They had no idea about the, the notion of a process and the relationships and the temporal precedence that occurred between them. It was very difficult to go to an IT group and tell the programmers, you know, I need for you to build this software tool to support the collaborative process. So the information-centric thinking was a dominant driver. So when I came back to school, you know, very ambitiously to teach, you know, I agreed to teach two new courses, one on collaborative engineering. I did not even have a graduate assistant. I was everything <laughs> from the beginning. And I agreed to teach two courses very foolishly. You know? <laughs> but it was an eye-opener because, of course, I was very young. You know, I used to wake up at 4.30 in the morning and ask my daughter jokes, Dad, you had hair at that time. Yes, I did. You know? <laughs> but it was a very energy-oriented environment where I identified other peers who realized that computer scientists and mechanical and manufacturing engineers have to have a holistic thinking. This will not be successful if you simply train the mechanical engineers, you know, on the, on, on the physics-based classes, on the modeling efforts, and there was no correlation to programming. And you won't believe it, the IT industry is the most dominant today in the world, but they do not police themselves. Okay, so off the record, if you talk to most of the experts, they will be very hesitant. But most IT projects, the success rate is about 50%, which means 50% of the costs gets tagged on to us. This is the reason why Fortune 500 companies will give you a $20 million budget, and they'll throw in a caveat for $5 million because they know things will go wrong. So the software engineering thinking even though it's predominant, is not adopted by most software companies in the world, right? And they are today having, you know, still in the throes of the heyday, the software engineering industry is going to struggle at some point in time. And rather than allow them to simply go about the ways, we want to train mechanical and industrial and other engineers to get more software oriented so that we can change the way we build systems. So this group that I'm involved in, when I made the transfer, right, we have about five faculty and about 20 to 30 students. We have faculty who are very good at uh, creating digital mockups. We have faculty who are very good at data analytics, others in cybersecurity. And we focus on industry-oriented projects. You know, we have other projects where we are designing UAVs to track tornadoes, very practical, massive systems where we are collecting data and we are using it, you know, for, for social causes, which I've been very, you know, interested in. So my objectives are emphasize the need for this information-centric approach, right? It's very holistic, it's difficult. I will use practical projects from manufacturing and healthcare from the field of medicine. I will talk about some of the breakthrough technologies and why we need to get involved with the next internet. And then, of course, you know, what we already know about IoT and CPS, how can they help engineering practices, and then round them off with an overview of the challenges. So we know the story about before Google, right? We wanted information. It was not there, or we had to go to these, you know, when I was growing up, it used to be these Britannica encyclopedias. You'd have to go A to Z and hunt for it. Today, if I needed something, I go on the web. There is one catch, right? The catch is we don't know whether the data presented on the web is true or not. We do have alternative facts that's become a part of it. You know, and I was shocked one day when I just uh, was checking my mail early in the morning, and there was this blurb that said, Tom Selleck had died. You know, this was the guy I like to see in a show, TV show called Magnum. And I did not realize, of course, that's just a news item. But then I looked for some information called concurrent engineering. 
heavy duty, you know, theoretical outlook. And the main web page that popped up, this is from England, and I'm not going to you know, take a shot at our English cousins over here, but the website said exactly the opposite of what concurrent engineering is. How many of you know what concurrent engineering is? It is not doing things concurrently. It's a misnomer. It's about simultaneously considering the design perspectives from different life cycle perspectives. And this web page from a reputed university talked about concurrent engineering. And when I gave a quiz question for my students, guess what? The first source was the wrong source, right? So the realities have not changed, which is ethics. You'll see me go back to the old quote from a follower of Plato many thousand years ago, has not changed. People cheat. People are unethical. And people go to prison, right? The only difference is the big thief gets away, the little thief gets caught, right? So when we move towards cyber technologies, let's be aware while this quest for a smarter, more perfect universe seems to be within reach, it still rests on our human values. Removing the human values would mean these cyber tools are going to tear down the fabric of civilization. So here's, of course, you know, one of these things I saw from a colleague. You know, it's a joke about someone passing away. But hey, no worries. Whether I go to Canada or the Philippines, I have a cloud-based access, so there are benefits you know, to emails and technologies. Now, the thrust of my talk is towards agile behavior. Right? Customers, you know, gone are the days, and you and me, we are customers as well, right? As well as service providers. Gone are the days, and I think yesterday, two keynote speakers talked about it, customer requirements change. Customers are very fickle, they're whimsical, and they feel, you know, industry needs to cater to them. Nothing to do with the economy in many ways. The economy reflects what they wanted. This is great for the customers, right? You go into, uh, you know, Amazon or somewhere else, you shop around. I've not had great experience with these groups, but my students say they like it. They don't have to go anywhere, right? But then the requirements change. When the requirements change, enterprises need to be able to change, right? Enterprises who want to survive can say, I'm just making laptops. The ones who are in the life cycle, value added chain, need to be able to have engineering services where probably they can be able to make water bottles or shoes. You'll see me talk about other examples, right? So enterprises need to adapt and respond and having an information-centric basis would mean I will be able to take on the challenges, that I will survive and succeed. So the notion of agile behavior, well known, right? The cheetah, one of the most agile land animals, right? It's nimble and quick. The deer changes direction. I've seen so many, you know, National Geographic videos where the deer gets away, right? And that's what happens to our enterprises. We think we are very agile for a number of reasons, but most enterprises struggle. Customer requirements change. We don't know what can happen, right? Look at Nokia. Look at Blackberry, right? Someone else who was not familiar with the technology or industry said, you know what? I can do this. I get it. Right? And the best example would be probably Apple, right? Some companies know a certain process, they feel they have dedicated customers, but that the era is gone, right? You have a new set of younger entrepreneurs who are willing to take the risk, who feel they can understand a process and they can deliver a better product. You know, when Microsoft got into Xbox industry, that shook me up a lot, right? But now it's becoming commonplace. Google now actually makes robots, right? And now everyone wants to get into driverless cars. So the notion that you need to be having, you know, 50,000 engineers of, you know, 25 years of engineering pedigree does not exist anymore, right? The companies who understand the basics, who can put together an arsenal of tools with well-defined interfaces, along with some engineering you know, thinking, 
will be the ones who survive. So what is ICA? ICA basically, you know, it's a very common sense idea, adopting information-centric ap approaches along with technologies, right? Having an approach and not having a technology is me talking about driving a Formula One in a racing car and sitting here as opposed to actually going there and winning something, right? And your resources are going to play a very key role. Why do I need this? For collaboration, for collaboration, for collaboration. If you do not have a collaborator today and you're a company that does everything from start to finish, guess what? You may not exist in another five to 10 years. You better be very flexible and you have an arsenal of information-centric resources, cyber and physical, right? And ensure that you can work in a temporary partnership, right? Many years ago in the US, we had this major initiative defining the notion of a virtual enterprise, right? And the Swiss were very keen to adopt it. The notion being, you know, I can team up with my competitor to make a product, right? Protect my IP and have a variety of platforms that can still exchange information. Right? That model may or may not hold because the problem is trust. When we don't see someone and we had uh, some excellent papers yesterday that talked about establishing trust, but you really can't quantify trust very well, right? Human behavior is very difficult to model. I think the US elections drove home the idea. One, what the elections predicted were completely wrong. Did the statisticians get it wrong? Probably, but most engineering models rely on probabilities. They assume they have the correct probabilities. And guess what? Most probabilistic models in reality will fail when it involves human behavior. Because human behavior can change two hours before the election or 10 hours before the election. So if you have a mathematical model and it's very advanced and you've gotten the best paper award for it, it does not mean it's of any value to the real world if your assumption on where to get these reliable probabilities is flawed, right? So we have three levels of integration. I'm gonna talk about these two, right? We all know about data, right? Most of my students, <laughs> we challenge them. Data is raw, right? I just take what there is. If I'm sitting here and I look at the number of people who are more than five feet or less than them, that's data, right? Information is processed data, something to give me an idea about the audience, about perhaps the number of people, right, beyond that. Knowledge is more complex. Knowledge is, you know, being able to change the variables and being able to reason about the information and data, right? The first two are challenging. We have the AI-based systems, you know, people talked about production rules and we won't go into that, but the thrusters, you have to automate the data, but without integrating them, it's a waste of time. You might as well go home, right? So in the 80s, you know, when I started out in industry, it was still changing, but I remember my boss, an ex-Marine, who said, you know, when he worked at IBM, they would go into consulting, you know, activities with Fortune 500 companies, Ford and GM and others. And he gave me one classic example where the manager called him and he said, you know what you need to do? Do not disrupt our engineering process. I'm going to give you, you know, a set of rooms in the back of the building. You need to set up your staff and make sure you link everything. Guess what? Did not work, it failed. Today it's changed. Information is the most potent entity in an enterprise. It drives everything. It is the glue, which means if I did not design my enterprise to handle the information exchange, to support the functionality, your organization is going to fail. So when you look at this idea, it's the driver and the glue, right? If I do not get this right, the information between this is going to fail, obviously the exchange. And it's just beyond just getting information from point A to point B. It's understanding the complexities and the correlation between this data exchange that makes it very difficult to understand. So in the I strategy, 
we have the three core faces, right? And it's a play on words. What we say is, is doesn't matter what enterprise you are, you have to model the information, but do not make something. You know, look at all these 3D printing companies. <laughs> Remember, as a mechanical engineer, why did we tout 3D printing? Because we did not have digital markups, right? One of the best examples is a company called Logitech that made this mouse, right? They got into 3D printing because they wanted to design and they wanted some human factors analysis whether someone would like this mouse. So the 3D printing came into existence because we wanted a rough cut method to quickly assess a design. That was the intent. Today it's become a process by itself, right? So you gotta model the information, but do not make something if you can simulate it. Simulate it as much as you can, physics or non-physics based, and both these are linked to the exchange without the data arriving on time, without your data and information addressing the semantic inconsistencies, your strategy is going to fail. So we have the, the famous Venn diagram. You model the information, very difficult by itself. You simulate them, and the last one is you exchange them, right? So when you look at it from academia, most engineering schools, I think in Europe, there's a greater emphasis on information modeling. In the US, I think we have like five universities that actually teach information modeling in engineering, right? So the best way to explain this is, if I go to Microsoft and I have some um, peers and friends who work over there, right? Before I build the operating system, I need to have an information model. My software engineers, if they screw up, then I have a bad operating system. So Microsoft may not be a great example on that, but the ability to understand the relationships as well as model the use case scenarios becomes extremely important. So we have two classes of relationships, right? The functionality, and we use the Burger King example, right? What goes on in Burger King? That's the functional dependencies, right? When you talk to experts, and this was the big deal out of the Wright-Patterson project, right? Experts agreed the world over whether you're doing, you know, cancer surgery or, you know, you're an expert swimmer. You ask them, what do you do? There are certain elements that is captured. That's important. But if you went and asked the same expert, how would you do it? Then the time-based verbiage comes in. And without understanding these two, simply writing a program that seems to satisfy a narrow customer's focus, it's obviously going to fail. The second one, again, academia needs to take, again, criticism is not being able to teach students and not having a workforce that is well skilled in creating 3D-based, physics-based models, whether it's a mechanical engineer or others, right? Most programs in the US, they are computer science based, right? And computer scientists are great, I teach in CS. They don't know how to create an engineering model, right? So when I go to an ACM conference on virtual reality, they're talking about video games. We have the video games of life, which needs to be modeled and captured, which are far more complex, right? So mechanical engineering departments, as well as you know, manufacturing or design engineering programs, need to go beyond that and talk about how do I represent a process, right? It's complex. But if I don't understand a process, and I'm sitting here and I'm having pages and pages of tables, then my students will not get the skills. Focusing on theory is great. And then you go to simulation methods. How do I simulate a process? Picking up a part, gripping up something, maybe having a feedback loop represented. And then finally, visualizing them. Complex issues for the next generation. But engineering universities are very stubborn. You know, if you took a survey, I don't know how many in Europe, but I can tell you there's probably more programs in Japan and China that focus on these than in the US and possibly Europe. The third area where engineers and CS has to come together is exchange, right? You model them, you simulate them, but worry right from the beginning about exchange, right? You need to have robust frameworks. You know, you can use commercial tools if you can, but most commercial tools fail to address 
semantic interoperability, right? So when you look at uh, just the term and what it means, you look at literature, most European researchers have a very good understanding. The US, still a major struggle. So that's why every year I go to this conference, you know, organized by my good friend, Arve Paneto, whom I, you know, when I Googled, I found out this is, there are these groups in Europe that focus on semantics and manufacturing, which is a major issue. In the US, you know, there's probably three groups that actually tackle semantic issues. So here is again a very classical example, right? Why do I need this model? Why can't I just go code? You know, why can't I get my theoretical models and get these charts and just tell my programmers, hey, get to it? So here's a very simple life cycle. So I put it on, put this on purpose. We have task one, you do something, you design, you simulate, you build, and you deliver. Looks fairly straightforward, does it not? Now Here's the problem. When the programmer or your software engineers, you know, get to work, right? There is a software design element, what we refer to as software engineering, right? You can train the mechanical engineers or get the software engineers to become more mechanical oriented. Right? But you have several categories or classes of data and information that control each of these components. And each component, and we demonstrated this when we actually designed and built and launched a satellite that's actually running in space right now. And each of these boxes can be decomposed to 30 or 300 levels. They're very, very complex entities. So again, common sense, right, from the group from ICANN. So what do I need? I would need to know whether it's a cyber or a physical input. Who are the performing agents, or what are they? And then what are the outcomes, the most complex, right? The cyber and the physical, and how do they look back? And what are my constraints for the process? The very difficult constraints that are difficult to model. And lastly, what are the temporal relationships? So that same model, again, just at the top level, becomes very complicated. Because I need to be able to understand what's my driver. Is it knowledge, data, or information that needs to come in? What are my constraints? And then how do I map some of the feedback between these components themselves? And then what are the major decision outcomes? And this is just you know, a very figurative representation of reality. But this is the modern enterprise that we are looking at. Now, in a cyber-physical context, right, I could have you know, companies that could do planning, or I could have three companies working on planning. I could have six companies doing my simulation, and maybe 100 companies doing my build. And the interaction between them needs to be seamless, which is what we are trying to drive towards. So a dominant part of you know, today's engineering is you know, the, the realization that you no longer have to be worried about a quarter million dollar systems, right? So these are images of cave-based systems at Iowa State. We have a slightly lower version called the power wall. And the system we have in our lab, you know, we bought this 10 years ago, we still use it occasionally, is a half a million dollars, right? Today, the biggest revolution is being able to drive down the cost. So we have switched from the half a million to you know, a value-based system that is $700. We do sacrifice quite a bit of resolution, but it's nimble. We can carry it to different places. And there are three levels of immersion, right? Often we mix the realities of virtual reality. Right? Most gamers are in the non-immersive environment. Right? The non-immersive basically says, you know, I can run the simulation, I'm here. I can use gestures, you know, like the Wii or something else, but I'm still outside. The semi-immersive system, I wear my 3D eyewears, I have sensors on my body, I can still go in and come out. But when I'm not looking at the 3D screen, I have the reality of the world. The last one, the more expensive, is the full immersion where I go in, right? It's like the matrix. If someone knocks me out and puts me there, I can stay there forever. 
but we're not going to get into that, right? We talk about this. So on the left side, we built a very advanced simulator that's being used at a hospital to train residents in actually surgery. It's not a toy, it's a very advanced simulator, but it's an expensive one. But we've migrated from there to these three systems. One is the wife, and again, I have no financial ties, including stocks and bonds with these companies. That's a disclaimer. So you have the wife, you have the HoloLens, which is about $3,000, and then you have the Oculus Rift, right? So the advantage of having this is, you know, of course, you can make the Walt Disney cartoons, but that's not our intent. Our intent is to build engineering models and there's an assortment of applications, which I'll briefly talk about, right? In the manufacturing context, you have both physics and non-physics based, right? To have physics-based feedback, you do need haptic devices, which I'll be talking about. But you can do assembly planning, G-code simulation, you can compare plant layouts. The complexity comes in this understanding that CS students struggle, right? When you look at manufacturing, you have levels of abstraction. You have the process level, right? The foundation. You have the workstation level, or you have the factory level. And remember, even though 3D printing is great, it still is going to be expensive for you. So if you can simulate it, simulate, modify your design, you know, change what you need. So digital mockups, I'm just giving you examples, you know, from real world scenarios. Here we have a robotic, you know, workstation level, a small conveyor that can assemble an assortment of different parts. So here is at the factory level, which is more complex by itself. So these factories, again, are not cartoons. I can run algorithms, I can change the routes. And the notion of concurrent engineering becomes predominant here because I can do the same as one of my students said using MATLAB. Why would I need 3D environments? Why? Because we engineers are bad at communication. If I have a cross-functional theme like in this demo which I'll run, I won't run the whole thing. We engineers are big on egos. We think we have Plato and Socrates put together. But the problem is when you have a complex scenario and you have a lot of functional relationships, and you're looking at that same model, the electrical engineer who's working on control theory or some other aspects might find the problem in a 3D environment faster. So in this scenario, which I'm going to run, I won't run the whole thing, we have a factory, right? We have a genetic algorithm, the industrial engineer is working on the layouts, we have three or four layouts. So the trajectory is on where to keep the part and where to get the feedback. The electrical engineer was more involved. But we took some of the outputs from a C++ program and we ran it and the electrical engineer found out it wasn't doing what she thought it should be doing. Right? So I'll just give you a quick run for this, of this rather, let me see, I'll have a pause on this. And I think with the help of my student I had this demo started because it was an actual recording. I just run it just for a few seconds just to give you an idea, the power of you know, virtual prototyping. Right? These are CAD models built from scratch, reflecting a factory. So we have control commands that dictate all the steps that the robot is going to do and how the conveyors are functioning at different speeds and feeds and all the other details. Right? I just run it just for a few seconds, a very long model by itself. But we ran this for a, a car company that wanted to invest in certain number of machines, certain amount of land. So we gave them three scenarios. How many machines do you need? What will be your output rate? And we could predict that fairly well. Yeah, we have five more minutes, all right. No, until the discussion. Okay. So there are some elements that cannot be predicted, right? People will always say, are we done? You know, when we went for a meeting, most people in industry thought we solved the CAD CAM problem. You know, they said, hey, that's an old problem. Actually, it's not being solved, you know. We just stopped focusing on that and we started moving to a different situation. So using the domain of microassembly, where we are working with some manufacturers, or rather we worked with a few, to assemble micron size biomedical sensors, right? Trying to simulate something is very difficult. 
right? We all know that, right? And then we got to do the mathematical modeling, and then we got to bring it into the virtual reality environment. And our goal was, you know, we had an assortment of grippers, and we wanted, if the customer had a very unique gripper, which they did not want to share the details with us, right? We wanted a simulator that would give them a fairly decent answer, because at the micron level, certain grippers, depending on the shape, you know, you can pick up a part, but when you're going to assemble the sensor, they will stick to the gripper. This is not something, I know those of you who were in my previous presentation yesterday, I talked about it. So modeling this is complex. It's not that we remove the engineering from it, but we want the mechanical engineers, you know, focus on something like Van der Waals force, which we have some few derivations. And some of these do not have closed form solutions. They have complex, you know, integrations that need to be done. You calculate the energy, and then you have to calculate the force by itself. But it was a driver to say why such an interdisciplinary perspective is important, right? Because as these graphs will show you, right, these forces start becoming dominant when you're very close to each other, right? So when I'm standing here, between me and Imbri, there's actually a Van der Waals force, but it's very, very low. So as I get closer and closer, depending on my size, you know, if I was really a micron, then it would become dominant, right? And that's what the simulation models are intended to do. You know, there's no magic black box. You know, I can't buy a software right now that does it unless one of my students decides to become a millionaire and starts manufacturing the simulators, which they might. Second is another view. We are working with some printed circuit board manufacturers in Oklahoma. As you know, you know, the American manufacturing base is very small. Most go overseas. We still have a few. But the way we are helping them be competitive is we created an IoT-based system for the factory. You know, it's a living environment. And this is a 3D environment built from scratch. You know, people say, how do we do this? Well, there are very expensive scanners that can build 3D models, but we built them from scratch. I think some we got them from the scanners. So this is a menu-based system where the manager or the engineer can change the layout depending on the, the product design. So if the product design changes, right, how do I change the layout to still be able to meet the customer requirements? So I'm switching from process simulation to discrete event simulation. I should be able to do both. And this menu-driven system allows me to do this. So what's the big deal? The big deal is don't do anything physically until I plan, I come back, I have two or three layouts, then I look at my throughput, I find out where the bottlenecks are, and then I go after the bottleneck areas, then I change the feeder positions, I change the chip layouts, and then I am able to have a tractable solution. Now, we move from visualization to haptic technology. Like I said, I do not have any relationships, any of these manufacturers. Haptic technology has a long way to go. There's about four or five vendors, you know, they're all great. Cost is still high. We've used some of them, not very intuitive. We don't know why those of you who want to become entrepreneurs, good way to become a billionaire. Bring down the cost, work at a more, you know, accurate mechanical model. Then, of course, even though I criticize the gaming industry, you do have a large pool of customers over there. So we're moving towards the last part of exchange, you know. So the, in the US and in uh, Europe, right, there's a bigger thrust, including Japan, China, and Korea. The main reason is why are we not satisfied with the current internet? A recap, a little bit of my yesterday talk. The internet protocol is very old. It's on its last legs. We can be doing patches and handling all these crashes in the servers, right? And there are a lot of changes, not just you know, in security, but also policy challenges on how to deal with data. I'm just looking at my time over here. So the Genie Initiator was created in the US. The counterparts you know, are fire in the EU. So the overall idea for, for Genie Wars, you know, we wanted to study the behavior of complex networks, right? Between New York and Los Angeles, and look at various different security as well as data exchange platforms. So the idea was if you had a new way to propose data exchange, the Genie test allowed us to go propose that idea and see 
but though it worked a lot. Now, SDN is one of the more dominant principles that came out of this group. Uh, it's used both in Fire as well as in Genie. So the overall idea is you don't have to buy the routers from one vendor anymore. The current vendors are, you know, they are overall going to get bankrupt at some point in time. Cisco comes for the meetings. So using SDN, you can program the behavior of the network traffic. This is the big deal. It allows you and me more flexibility to go and buy different sets of tools and put them together. And it does this far more efficiently than the older internet. In Europe, it's called a FIRE. You know, great acronyms, Genie and FIRE. You know, who can beat this? So FIRE stands for Future Internet Research and Experimentation. Yes, those of you looking for funding, this is it, you know. Uh, I am told the FIRE's budget is about 10 times more than the US budget. So there are substantial projects. I don't know, I talked to some of you. Go work with your computer science counterparts if you're CS. Go work with your mechanical and manufacturing counterparts. And FIRE also has collaboration projects you know, with several countries. Feel free to ask me if you need more information. So IoT-based systems and cyber-physical systems the ICE revolution, you know, basically created this arsenal of technologies, right? Most of these are common sense, right? But our perspective is slightly different. You'll see other speakers talk about, you know, what is CPS, what are the attributes? We look at it from a functional viewpoint, right? Which means if I've captured or addressed these requirements, I have a feasible system. So we talk about, you know, designing the cyber components, the interface components, the physical components, the feedback and monitoring components, which is often overlooked, and last of all, the networking capabilities itself. So IoT, it's still a network for me, even though others, you, you'll see me talk about that. So why do we do IoT, you know? Do we want to look cool? Yeah, of course, you know, a little bit. But to most of the presentations, IoT is about just data exchange. You know, I, I sat in on a seminar now we had five speakers talk about IoT, and all they did was cloud-based computing. If you really want to you know, embrace IoT you know, in a very functional way, it's about taking the data that's embedded in something, in a sensor, and putting it to good use. But if you don't need the data, don't do it, right? So you might have a smartphone like the manager next to me, who was getting data from a real world machine in Ohio, you know, I tell this over here. So what does it do for me? It enables an agile response. That manager can alert his staff about a problem, or if there's new customers arriving, you know, uh, instruct an arsenal of other software tools to predict, you know, what can go wrong or what can go right on the shop floor, right? So the overall idea is this, to have an agile response if my data centers did not provide me that information, but more importantly, preempt the problems, right? We are, we are going to be working with a group that handles uh, you know, oil supply, right? So we have sensors in different parts of the country, right? But you'll be surprised, the oil industry is so behind. You know, when something goes wrong, they have to send someone physically, it takes a couple of days, they shut down the oil line, then they do repacks, right? But there are actually monitors in the industry that can tell you something is going wrong with the pressure or the temperature or something else that can lead to fractures in a pipe, right? So that is the value of IoT. It's about exchanging the data for a value-added response, not because we think it's cool. Of course, there are others who think IoT is more of a complex ecosystem. There's an entire industry behind IoT. But understand it's all about exchanging data to add value to your life cycle process. So here again, you know, I've thrown more mundane uh, images of IoT coming to dominate. But like I said, if you don't want Google peeking over your shoulder and advising your kids what to do, don't get that IoT device into your home. Because once it's in, it's not going to leave. You know, I really don't know anyone who goes back. So think about IoT before you embrace it. But here is a very practical context for manufacturing. On the right side, I've given you know, a sort of a factory, but it's actually not co-located. 
you have work cells, you have you know, assembly cells, you have CNC machines, right? You have robots interacting them. So sensors and cameras can exchange information, right? They are working at the data level, not at the information level. Then you could have an arsenal of tools on the left side, you know, interacting through cyber interfaces. You could do design analysis, you have simulation tools, you have design interpretation tools, you have scheduling tools, you have assembly planners, and you have interaction modules. So you can do the whole arsenal as long as you have your I strategy. You know, if you're going to call in a Fortune 500 company, they're going to charge you $20 million for this, and the system will still not work. So the fundamentals need to be right. You got to model, you got to simulate, then you got to make sure you have your exchange-based strategies in place. So the challenges, again, are, you know, again, people ask me all this time, the challenges most of us have moved beyond the implementation, they're looking at analysis, feedback loops, and that's fine. But our group, or one of the few, said, you got to be able to design this framework. Where do I start from scratch, right? So the ICE-based approach that I've outlined, even though it's not a class by itself, it gives you an idea on how to address this from using the three facets of modeling, simulation, and exchange. So the challenges also has been, you know, so what's the next internet? How is it going to help? So we built a very practical, accessible cyber physical test bed. Again, we get the question, so what's the big deal? The big deal is it's one of the few advanced manufacturing systems that can do cradle to grave. We don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk, and we are still expanding on its capabilities so it can assemble something from distributed locations using simulation and information exchange. And yes, this has not been demonstrated by any group to our knowledge. It's the first fully functioning smart test bed where we don't simply talk about theory, but we've actually implemented it. And here are snapshots of some of our cyber physical resources. I won't go into the GE-based networking, but we've collected data and it shows it actually works. So there's very complicated interfaces and apps involved. And here is another snapshot of the PCB factory where we have IoT sensors that pick up information from the factory, the work cell, could be machine to sensor data, RFID information. They are fed back to this cloud of simulators. And the neat aspect about this IoT framework is it's not purely cyber, right? We compared the simulation data with the real world data, and we found there was a mismatch. So the mismatch, when we went back to brainstorm and analyze, had to do with training shop floor personnel who could not follow the simulation details. And we had not captured all the intricacies in the simulation models. And finally, we were able to close the gap between simulation and reality. So here again is another snapshot of an information-centric model. Again, since I don't have time, I'll just wave my hand. But the overall idea is, if I have a very detailed, information-rich map, this map can propel interface and interact with my software components. If I change the intricacies of this model, the behavior of my collaborations can change. And that's the real uh, impact of using such an approach. Here again, you know, different snapshots. I apologize. Yes. I would like to take some questions from oh, okay. the audience, if you don't mind, because right. maybe some other aspects are also interesting. Yes. OK, it's sorry. Possible yeah. Do you want me to just wrap it up? Yes? OK, that's not a problem. Yeah, I, I may have overshot. So I think <laughs> before I close, the Smart Cities Initiative is a big deal in uh, Europe, right? I'll just talk about that for a few seconds, you know. So get involved if you're engineers, right? It's deployed. There are about four uh, cities in Europe, the Smart Center, where they're using IoT-based sensors to find some common sense application from parking to temperature control. You know, there are many applications over there in the US, so I'm, again, going to skip quite a bit. Even though I did a couple of dry runs, I seem to have overshot. And again, for those of you, you know, who are more interested in practical applications, we apply the iSpace approach and we are doing cyber-based training for surgeons in a medical hospital. So another just a few seconds over there. And 
I'll come back to some of the, the challenges. Challenges are, you know, security, privacy, back to security. Trust is very difficult between, you know, organizations as well as software tools. Semantic interoperability has not been fully addressed by itself. And like I said, two major areas which our group feels is important, ethics, right? You know what happened to Facebook, but most of you don't realize when the Facebook founder was in school, he had ethics violations. We studied this. It has not changed after all these years. So as professors, emphasize ethics more than engineering, because engineering can be acquired, the skills. So ethics is probably the biggest challenge today in the cyber world. You know, Diogenes quote, you see me all the time talk about the great thief leads away the little thief. If you're 35, if you own $35 billion, you're going to get away with it. The second aspect is this whole area of entrepreneurship is extremely important. Students should no longer, you know, just think about just starting uh, with a company and staying with them. They should be attempting to change the world, right? And we have been trying to encourage this, you know, and we always talk about learning. If, if we can learn something, let's put this into practice. And with that, I'll conclude my apologies for running over the time. I think this is a very exciting area, but it's not so much about the technology as the understanding of the human issues. This is why I think the core part of what it is to be in a civilized world is going to come because if we are so focused on making a fortune, you know, a good part of what we are in terms of being in just humans is going to fade away very soon. With that, I conclude. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, there are two questions. All right. Thank you very much for your talk. Sure. It was really great. I think um, I really like the ICD approach with the right. modeling and um, simulation and exchange. Right. Let me ask you one thing. What do you think? How can you model cyber physical systems with the cyber part and the whatever, and the physical part and the cloud and the network and everything? Is there a certain approach, a language to, to in the very early? Right. Um, Right. So there are a variety of modeling languages that you have, right? So I'm going to tell you what the industry uses in software circles. So we have the unified modeling language, right? The problem with the UML is on the activity modeling, on the function modeling, they're not very structured. The use case diagrams, there's a possibility. Then uh, we have used a homegrown enterprise modeling language, EML, which is fairly well used. And then the older generation, and I have to say some of them are very good at it, they used uh, IDOF zero function modelings. In, uh, in Europe, you know, my counterparts in France, they like the, the BPML modelling languages to look at it. So it depends on your context and what you're comfortable with, right? So I would not say, you know, don't just, uh, rather, don't try to stick to one modeling language. You need to come back and answer exactly your question, right? For us, EML has worked very well. And EML has an XML parser, which means when I identify the constraints, right? So the, my model, I don't have much time for that, right? So each one is actually a state entity, right? But, that, but we have four categories of data associated with it, right? We have the information input, so whether it's cyber or physical, an assembly plan, or uh, access to a database, right? Then we have the performing agents, could be software, human, could be a factory, or the levels of decomposition, right? So we have information triggers which can map the relationships among the various entities. So the chart that I showed you was not pinned to a modeling language, but I can show you some offline where we have a network. Thank right? you so much. We have to conclude here. Right. And I believe there will be break time and there right. is lunch uh, time, uh, um, I'd say, opportunity for posing right. the question. I and have to go further with the program. Yes, no problem. And I'll come and talk to you since you had a question. Exactly. All Sorry right. for that. But no problem. All further. right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, I would like to invite our